Hello, everyone. My name is Yvonne Monique Livingston, and this is the Art of Black Psychology. And so what that means to me is everything, right? You know, it's, it's my existence, it's my life, it's everything that's around me. And so I like to apply different things to get into the mind of Yvonne, right? And how she looked at things prior to going off to college. And so when I went to college, the things that changed me made it unique, you know, because I was able to look at myself from multiple perspectives, starting with my children. And when I volunteered, I started volunteering at the Urban Youth Trauma Center. Um, what came out for me was, man, dang, you know, I was a horrible parent, you know, at times, you know, and so I had to create a balance in between, you know, my parenting style and who I am as an individual. And so what came out was this whole new thing. And this is Dr. Lisa Suarez, y'all. And one of the things I really loved about her was her realness and allowing me to be who I was and not judge me, you know, because sometimes we're really harsh on ourselves as parents and that we really don't understand the impact of our actions due to our children. And so I want Dr. Sawyers to introduce herself and tell us about what she does down at the clinic um, and, and what her goals are and why she does the work that she does. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you for having me in your program. I'm excited and I support the work that you do and excited that you're part of our team. Um, I am a psychologist. I am associate professor at the University of Illinois in Chicago. I'm the co-director of the Urban Youth Trauma Center, which is a SAMHSA funded center aiming to raise awareness about the impact of trauma and violence on youth and families. And I'm also the director of the Pediatric Stress and Anxiety Disorders Clinic at UIC. And we are trying to help support um, kids and their families who have been impacted by anxiety, trauma, as well as other issues. And so some of the goals that we have are to um, help people understand how to support kids and be more supportive to and be more um, able to take care of themselves and their families and also help to train um, people who come in contact with youth to be better able to provide that support in, a, in the best way possible to understand where they're coming from. That's, that's exactly what it is, right? And my new parenting style is exactly what she just said, right? But all of my children are grown. And so with me being down in the clinic, uh, part of what I do is to, you know, I remember these scenes and situations that's happened in my life and I compare it to what I'm hearing and what I'm listening to. And so it brings flashbacks, you know, it brings back memories of what I should have done as a parent, but then understanding why I did things as a parent. And so yesterday, Dr. Suarez and um, the team, we were learning. And so you talked about exposure therapy and what it is. And so as you were speaking about your daughter and the worm and everything, and it was really cute, <laughs> um, how you were able to get her to you know, hold a worm and, and the community that you used in order to do it. Um, it wasn't just you, you used, you know, your neighbor, right? And so one of the things that was going on in my head while you were talking was exposure therapy from a Black perspective, right? And, and the reason why I said it is because I identify as a, a Black woman, an African-American woman, um, 49, right? Pretty much raised my children as a single parent. And so what, what happened was there were harsh punishments, harsh punishments that I did um, because I wanted to ensure that my children didn't get in trouble on the outside of my home, right? I didn't want them to have to deal with the law. And so the, the training part of the, the exposure therapy that I did in my home was to, you gotta act a certain way, you gotta speak a certain way, you know, you gotta make sure you look a certain way, you gotta, dress and you know don't mouth off to people and 
you know, and part of that training was if you mouthed out to me, this is what you would get, right? Inside the home and outside the home, right? Somebody's going to punish you because you're learning how to deal and you're learning how to, you know, accept your role in society, right? And your station in it. And so when I look at it from that perspective while you were talking, I was like, wow, right? It was harmful what I did, but then it was also me trying to save her. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can give a little context about what exposure therapy is, um, just to put everybody, um, clue everybody in in our conversation yesterday. So I was giving a training to a group of clinicians and team members as part of the anxiety clinic on um, how to address kids' anxiety and avoidance around things that they encounter in everyday life. So sometimes um, kids and adults have fears. So a lot of them are many, most of our fears are very necessary and reasonable and protect us from harm. There are other fears that are exaggerated that are based on sort of faulty information or, or not enough experience with a situation. And then people start avoiding situations like going to school, hanging out with friends because they have these unreasonable fears. And so there's a technique that psychologists and other mental health providers use that's called exposure therapy, where you gradually face the thing that you are afraid of in a controlled and supportive environment so that you can be better able to fulfill what you need to do in life, like go to school, hang out with your friends, have fun, get a job eventually, and stuff like that. So I was sharing an example with my family, and they're all about my daughter um, and sort of my neighborhood and how um, we helped her with some fear that she had about a worm uh, or worms in general. Um, but I think what you're saying, Yvonne, is the context in which we experience these challenges and that when things are relatively stable and the fear is a very specific worm that you can handle, there are ways that we can guide parents um, and families so that kids can do the things that they need to do. There are other times when um, there are a lot of other challenges um, and adversities and there are the world is not treating you in the way that you should be treated and the world hasn't treated, especially um, for Black families um, throughout history and still now today, um, there is a differential treatment for families and for um, kids and parents are at this crossroads about how to best prepare your child mm -hmm. because, um, and there are things that for your safety, you have to stay away from, you have to avoid certain things because it's not the same if you do them because you can get seriously hurt. Um, yeah. And it's because of the safety in the community, but also because of the discrimination and oppression that happens. Exactly. Right. And so as you were, so as you were speaking about that, you know, I, me being the community engagement coordinator, um, part of what I do is to share these stories and narratives to, you know, uh, close a gap, you know, because sometimes there's a lot of miscommunication in how, how our community looks like from our perspective and what other, other people on the outside looking in looks at community, right? Um, because over the summer, what I did to, you know, communicate with my community, I stood outside eating snowballs and I knew I shouldn't have been, right? It was full of syrup. But what happened was people began to share. And, and can you I, can you explain why you say you shouldn't have been just to give okay. that context? Okay. Yeah. Um, I was diagnosed pre-diabetic um, a few years ago. Um, and so mm -hmm. I watch my diet so that I don't eat harmful yeah. things to spike my sugar levels. And, you know, I end up on medication. So, 
you know, I have to watch my diet. And so that's what I do. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the the connection was so pure because I stood out there and bought them fuel bottles. <laughs> you know, it was it gave me an opportunity to get to know them and it gave them an opportunity to get to know me. And and we shared mm -hmm. stories, you know, and they gave me so much wisdom. I can't share everything because that was a private conversation. But just to generalize what happened was I saw a system that was in place. And it was, and their system that they had in place is the same one that I had, right? That it takes a village to, you know, keep the community safe. And so there's there's so many things that we talk about, right? Because I I don't want to judge because you know I did some harmful things too. And so I look at it from that perspective and give grace, you know, to people who, you know, experience adversities like I did. And so that's part of that's part of how you know I'm able to communicate as 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 well as I am, because I do share you know information, right? And the information that is shared is depending on who I'm talking to. And so the exposure for me was, you know, my son told me uh, um, not so long ago what police officers did to him. You know, just pulled them over and you know, ran them up against the wall and made him put his hands behind his back. And, you know, he didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And then when he asked, you know, they was like, they were laughing, you know? And so these are some of the things that we have to prepare our children for, you know? And there, there were situations in my home that did exactly the same thing, you know? to get them prepared for what they're going to see. And so is that necessary for us? You know, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say, right? But I definitely appreciate the training because my children are home. You know, they didn't, they don't mouth off. You know, all of the things that I taught them not to do, they don't do outside the home. So they mouth off in my crib. <laughs> but now we use it in a different way because they're grown, you know. So now we turn it into, you know, a trauma comedy hour, right? In order for us to get through some of those difficult topics, you know, uh, we have a saying in our community, you got to laugh to keep from crying. Because, you know, if you listen to the stories and you see that a lot of the stories match, it will make you think, you know. And I can imagine, you know, why therapists burn out you know, because they hear so many tragic stories that the information that, you know, once it's out, you know, you feel the relief. I, because once I got it out, I did, I felt so much better the re doing therapy and I did therapy during the pandemic. So that was great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so a lot of the things that, you know, uh, others experience, I help them with now um, just through conversation because I share you know, what I did to get myself through um, before therapy, during therapy, and post-therapy. Um, that's how I like to do it. You know, looking at how and what I use to um, change my behaviors. You know, church was one, you know, my belief in God, um, a support system. And now the full understanding of how children should be treated and how to talk to them, you know, through working with you at the Urban Youth Trauma Center. Um, it's really important for you know, parents to understand that there are different forms and ways of communicating. So I'm gonna be quiet so you can give them a few and then I'm gonna follow you and, and, and <laughs> with the examples of what I do now compared to what I did with you. Sure. Um, so you want me to talk about um, the some of the parenting um, recommendations right um, right right sure. of how to talk well, to I think children it, yes so i think it's important to understand the context where families are and as part of one of the main things that i want um, clinicians to understand so that they can help family members that they're working with um, and show that um, empathy, compassion, understanding, and support. Um, exactly. So we we don't want, 
kids who are impacted by adversity, poverty, crime in the community, violence in the community are dealing with a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes as mental health providers, we focus on finding the diagnosis and then how to treat that diagnosis. But we have to understand that things happen in a context. And uh -huh. sometimes there are, um, so for if I, my specialty is anxiety. And a lot of times we're looking for avoidance and we're looking for how to help people face their fears and do things and um, so that they can fulfill their full potential. Um, but sometimes because some of those fears are important to keep because uh -huh. there's there's safety, there's threats mm -hmm. to safety in the environment. And so some of the reason that people in the family do the things that they do have to do with that experience. And so it's finding a balance between the strategies that we've been trained about how to be supportive and um, help children grow um, and develop in a healthy way and at the same time, understanding where the parent is coming from, what kinds of challenges they're dealing with, what kinds of stressors and things that are going on in the community and trying to bridge the gap and provide support and find the way so that we can sustain the kid, but also sustain the person and the community that's sustaining right. that. Right, the two go together. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And kids can't just all of a sudden you know, take themselves to school and drive themselves places or um, pay for things. Right. And so we have to work with the system. And there's, you know, we we help a whole family. We're helping a whole community because that there's more kids, there's generations, and they have an impact in the community. So we have to think beyond the individual person that comes to the office. So that's one of the important messages that we try to do, whether it's part of the Urban Youth Trauma Center or the Pediatric Stress and Anxiety Disorders Clinic, that we consider the context. Um, we try to use strategies that have been shown to work. Um, uh -huh. So always looking for evidence-based approaches like cognitive behavior therapy, which includes exposure therapy, um, but also be mindful of the experience of families and the true challenges that they're dealing with, um, especially with different racial and ethnic groups um, that experience oppression and discrimination mm -hmm. and right. so many behavioral health disparities, which means that people have unequal access to care mm -hmm. and therefore mm -hmm. have negative outcomes associated with that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so just based on what you just said, here's how I'm getting ready to deliver. I'm going to do before, <laughs> during, and post therapy with Yvonne, right? Uh, so prior to me learning anything about, you know, proper parenting, right? Um, there was the, the yelling, the screaming, the belittling, um, there, there was some confidence building skills put in there, but it was more or less focused on don't be like this, you know, instead of be like this, right? Um, so you have to hold both of those things at the same time. And I didn't do that very well. Um, and so the, so the negative behaviors got punished and, and so the positive behaviors were said that that's what you're supposed to do. Right? You're supposed to get good grades in school. You're supposed to clean up your room. You're supposed to do all of these things because this is your space, right? But there is sometimes was confusion because then I would do it because then the helicopter pin came in, right? Um, and so the me being unbalanced, me not knowing how to parent because you know there is no parenting book. You know, is is experience. You know, is is what you learned um, growing up, what you're seeing around you, right? So I always saw discipline around me. Act this way, be this way, and then the outcome would be, you know, you've gone through some trials and tribulations, and so 
there's heaven on the other side when you learn how to act right and, you know, be right. And so that type of behavior for me, you know, when I realized going through college was, man, it was, that was just not okay, right? And so then I had to ask my mom some questions, you know, because if I had that behavior, then she had the behavior. That's why I got it from. And so we just kept going back, right? Until we found out where the behavior came from, you know? And so that would allow us to trace our genealogy and all that. So I did that, found out I'm part Nigerian. And so when you look at the culture and you look at the tribe, you know, and what they did to prepare their children for life, you know, those tactics, you know, I looked at it from that perspective in the present. Right. Um, because I had to learn that everything I did was still for survival. I didn't, you know, kill my children physically, but mentally there was a lot of harm. Right. Because of, you know, the training that I had to put them through in order to survive. And so when you talk about system and marginalization, then you understand that, you know, those adversities affected our lives and just made it very different and it, it happened generationally. And so when you look at it from that perspective and the fact that I didn't get help, none of us did. You know, I don't, I don't know personally anybody in my family that did therapy or even talked about it, you know, for that matter, right? Because therapy was God, therapy was going to church, therapy was talking to a friend, therapy was talking to your parents, like therapy was talking to all of the people that were around you. And if they didn't have good sound advice to give you, you know, then there were a lot of trials and errors, a lot of mistakes. Um, but for me, I learned from them. That's why I got six children. <laughs> <laughs> Not that my children are mistakes, um, but I would have had, I would have wanted to have children in a different context than what I did, um, because then, you know, hurt people hurt people. You know, and so now I'm trying to catch them from hurting other people, you know. Um, and so it's, 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 it's challenging work, but it's necessary in our community that we speak to each other, that we love on each other, and that we treat each other how we want to be treated. Um, but first knowing what that is by doing it to yourself first. As I used to say, I love people all the time, and I love myself. You know, so there was some disconnect there. And so now that I'm loving who I am and how I'm becoming Yvonne, you know, I started just being a parent, you know, because who was I? My daughter always said, she said, who were you before you became a mom? <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't know. You know, I didn't have an opportunity to explore. So that's what, so that's what I'm doing now, exploring Yvonne, you know, outside of the mom role, because in the black community, at least in my family, you know, once your mom starts having children, you know, the, the older children help with the, with the new child. Um, so that's also part of training. So I started that training at mm -hmm. six. <laughs> um, so I've been a mother for a long time. Um, but the roles that are interchangeable, you know, I also did to my daughter. So there's the harm, right? She didn't have her childhood. So that's what she's, currently experiencing now. So we're both children out here having fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know. And I think it's so important that you share your experience and you do it with such empowered confidence because um, it's important for people to um, overcome the shame that they might it feel is. from the yes. stuff that they've mm -hmm. been through and also understand, hey, this happened for a reason, for a struggle, mm -hmm. and a struggle that is generational, um, that shouldn't be, and that there is a way to do things differently, uh, but also the, the realization that you don't have to do it alone, that you can mm -hmm. reach out, and you just mm -hmm. have to find the right supports. Um, and some of the supports are not the right support. Some of the supports can be harmful. That's what you and your family have learned. And it's sort of trying to continue to surround yourself with the right mm -hmm. support and mm -hmm. build each other up, which is exactly. what you do constantly 
every moment of your life. So it's <laughs> so important that you share your story and to be so honest as you are. Yeah, I, my son told me the other day, he was like, he said, Ma, you know, speaking the truth is dangerous. And so I had the question of myself, why? And he said, because it can disrupt people's reality. And, you know, and that disruption can be so strong that it, it changes them. You know, it, it changes the person for who they are. And so, you know, I didn't understand quite what he meant by that. So, you know, it took me a minute to process what he said. And so that it is true right, that you can disrupt someone's reality with the truth, especially a truth that happened, you know, decades ago, right, and so that's that's currently what we're facing now, and so I told, um, but I'm going to say, I'm going to table that conversation for Dr. Volpe, uh, because <laughs> I, I told her that we can talk about that um, after our meeting yesterday. You all really, really, you know, impacted me in such a way yesterday, you know, sitting there learning, you know, from your perspective, you know, what these things are and then how I'm able to take in that information and then give myself grace, you know, for what happened to me and how I processed my life and how I looked at my own parenting. Because Dr. Adil the other day, uh, when he said that, that Dear Mama song, right? Um, Every time I hear it, right, it, it brings me to tears, you know, because that's what I wanted to be, you know, for my children. You know, I want them to sing that song to me one day, <laughs> but not in my funeral. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, nah, you want it now. <laughs> I want it now, right? Give me some, give me some roses, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I feel like a champion, you know, that I did make it through being a single parent to children four sons, two daughters, you know, that that's some amazing work, you know, and and you all give me the courage to pat myself on the back, like for real. <laughs> um, because I, I had so much to say yesterday. And so since I couldn't say, because I didn't want to interrupt your teaching, um, because we were on a limited amount of time. And so I just wrote a bunch of stuff down. I'm gonna share with you uh, what I wrote down. But it was it was so powerful, you know, that I wanted to bring you on to talk about this with our, our community, because a lot of us are catching flack, you know, from our children, because, you know, we harm them. You know, I'm not saying for, you know, forgive us, because we, we understand forgiveness happens in its own time, if it ever happens, right? But it was important for me to forgive myself so that I could move on, because I was stuck. I was constantly blaming myself for what I didn't do because I didn't have the resources to do it. Um, and so that's how I started freeing myself. You know, I didn't have the resources to do everything, you know, my children wanted me to do. And so I did the best I could with what I had. And so when my oldest son tells me that, I, you know, I just get it. <laughs> you know, and when my youngest son called me one day and told me, he said that, uh, my oldest son helped me because I can't say their names. They ain't agreed to work with me yet. So <laughs> um, he said that um, the oldest brother helped him process giving, getting over the harm that I caused them, you know, when they were younger. Um, and so that was helpful for me because that was a story that I didn't have to share. But sometimes I told my son, I said, well, why don't you act like I changed? <laughs> you know, you... You still keep me there. And then sometimes it's so painful, uh, Dr. Suarez, it's so painful for me to, to hear him um, tell these stories that I do. I bust up and start laughing um, mm -hmm. until, you know, he gets to be like, he's like, why you ain't funny, you ain't funny. And so then the defense attorney shows up. I say, you think I like that? You think I like being that way? You think I wanted to do that? You know, you know, I... You know, if I was in my right mind, I would have did this. I would have did this. You know, just allowing him to see that the change is here and the change mm -hmm. is here to stay. And um, it's his process to when yeah. he'll, he'll come to terms. You know, you are in a different place and you're in a place of growth and supporting others. He's sort of in maybe the place of realizing the impact of 
some of the things that happen and he has to get to the other side um, and it'll be in his time. And I'm glad that you said that because so many of us are wondering why or how or when they're going to get to that place, right? And so um, what what I want to share to with those parents is the time that it's taken my children to forgive me um, is warranted. The time that it takes for them to say, I love you every day is warranted. Um, and so what I like to do is just model out how I should be every day to my children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that model is Amanda Armour. I am going to say her name because <laughs> she agreed to work with me. <laughs> and so the, the work that she and I do is healing each other. She forgives me and I forgive her. Um, and so the forgiveness for me, for her, is forgiving myself for making her act that way. Mm -hmm. because she's a good child she always has been I named her love she came through on birth control pills so she's supposed to be here <laughs> and so you know once I start accepting her love and she started accepting mine then this this work looks a lot different you know it it, it makes me happy you know that at least one of my children works with me and I'm trying to I'm trying to bring the rest so my community engagement skills is working on it. <laughs> I'm sure they're working in other settings. You know, wherever they are, they're having an impact because of the growth that you're all doing, you know, and it doesn't have to be in the same way for everybody. Um, so I'm sure. Y'all see why I love her. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, right. I, I think that the experience of trauma and we were talking the other day about forgiveness and how mm -hmm. that's a journey and it's a personal journey and we may forgive um but we might still have the impact still mm -hmm. manifesting mm -hmm. in us because it's a trauma is a life process especially when you have so many traumas and also exactly. hit intergenerational mm -hmm. historical traumas as well that it it leaves a mark and it stays and it continues throughout generations. And so even though we might have forgiven, we every so often those effects pop up and we have to deal with them and they create an impact on us and how we behave towards others, especially those who were the ones who harmed us or at least how we perceive it. And it's just a journey and it changes over time, but it's been amazing to hear you um, share with me all the different ways in which you have grown with your family and how you acknowledge all of those. And I think it's impactful to for people to hear the stories raw and also see the other side of the growth and what's possible, right? And the uh -huh, other thing that uh -huh. we want to do is prevent um, exactly. with that story prevent right. others who are in it now so that they can see okay so that I'm not going through that now maybe we can change the trajectory right exactly and boost ourselves up you know into the future where everybody's opinions matter you know we do need to bounce off of each other we do need to talk to one another to you know gain support validation get help you know, provide support, give help. You know, it's it's a two way street now um, in my house, and I didn't, you know, because everything was my way. I was controlled, and I was a control freak too, along with that helicopter parenting. So, you know, it, it was man, it was it was ridiculous, you know, to say the least. But coming to the realization to just let everything go is is it was really to save my life. Um, because all too often Black women, they do take on a lot. And I want to tell Black women today that put that stuff down. You know, I, I, I tracked my heart rate um, a couple months ago and felt it like just go super fast, just by itself. I wasn't doing nothing. Um, but then that was my body's way of saying you've done too much already. 
you know, slow down, you know, take better care of yourself because you can't do it. And moms, you know, it's like, I throw the cape on and I start flying and I'm over here and I'm over there. I'm just trying to do it all. And I can't, you know, I did that already. Um, and so the stress of doing that type of work and being that way caused me to get sick in the first place. Um, and so when I feel those anxiety moments coming back up, you know, of how I used to respond to things, and you know, if I want to respond like that, Angela Hale told me last like, night, she said, do the breathing exercises, right? And I know, you know, what those breathing exercises are, but it's like, man, I'm angry right now. This is what I want to do. I want to do this and I want to do this, but those things are harmful to me, you know? And so taking that moment to sit back and breathe, taking that moment to read a book or go for a walk, um, taking a moment to just be silent. Um, and I've learned to now excuse myself from things that are out of my control or people start talking and I'm like, hey, you're, you're giving me too much. I excuse myself instead of listening and, you know, getting ready to go off on the deep end because I've, I've heard too much and I can say, you know what, that's enough for me. Let's table this conversation for a later date and make my, and, you know, and make my leave. That's what therapy has taught me how to do. Keep, get some boundaries, keep them up, you know, especially when they're necessary um, and to love myself unconditionally even though I've made some mistakes you know what you did that and but because you didn't know what to do in that moment and that's okay right and that's what therapy has taught me that's 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 what I continue to learn every day I work with you all and I'm able to deliver the messages that I get from the clinic in my own way because this is how I relate to the community um by sharing, you know, the stories in this way. Right. And so Dr. Suarez, thank you so much for your time and your efforts and all the work that you do. You know, I, I do want your program to go global. So quickly tell us a little bit about that because that's what I'm promoting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we have at the Urban Youth China Center a training program for better understanding the impact of trauma and violence anchored on um, the causes of violence, um, looking at a perspective that takes into account why violence happens from the individual, the relational, the community, and the societal reasons. And anchored on that, then we have a series of best practices for violence prevention and trauma intervention that mm -hmm. are anchored on um, how can we change the context for, for, for people and for communities. And we have translated it into things that every single person can do. And so we usually anchor the training on these principles and these best practices. And then we have a discussion about what does it look like for you based on the things that you're dealing with, with your community. So we've been, um, we've worked with people in the mental health field, people in schools. We also have a strong partnership with law enforcement um, that I would love to talk about at some other point, perhaps, um, just showing how things can be done differently when we work in partnership and, and sort of change those cycles of oppression. And the other thing that I wanted to say, just to wrap up, um, since we're going long on time, um, Ivad, is that we are um, a punitive society that is based on judgment and punishment. And we need to transition into a restorative society that is based on healing and um, based on you know, forgiveness, growth, and helping not just the person perhaps who was victimized, but also the victimizer um, so that things can happen in a different way. We can't just label people as bad 
or violent and lock them away or, or put them so that they can't do anything anymore. We need to recognize that we all have the potential for growth. We all make mistakes um, and we just, that's how we learn. We learn by touching the stove and then, oh no, I shouldn't touch that, right? That's that's human, human beings and one-on-one. And so why can't we apply that principle to the justice system and to all kinds of systems so that we can um, be better able to grow and heal. Thank you for wrapping that up. Uh, thank you all for this segment of the Art of Black Psychology uh, with Dr. Lisa Suarez uh, down at the Urban Youth Trauma Center where I am part of the team. So y'all come on down, y'all check out the website. They got so much information up um, to help you learn and grow with your children, parents and caregivers, teachers, anybody who's invested in children and seeing that they get all of the resources they need. And you get some resources too, because listen, parenting does not come with a handbook. Talk to y'all later. Peace. Thanks. Thank you.